I was scrolling through Instagram admiring the outfits the stars of Shaga Ilembe wore to the show's premiere at Monte Casino in June. Shaga Ilembe, meaning the axe, is DSTV's story of the making of a great African king. We haven't always had stories about great African men proudly advertised as prestige television, nor so many options of where to find what we want to watch. Streaming services come at a low monthly price point, and most of us shuffle between similar providers trying to avoid missing out on what's trending locally and internationally. A few decades ago, the Brudot Bond had a tight monopoly on South African attention spans, instructing the apartheid government to keep foreign ideas. Ideas, people, programs, contrary to Afrikaner nationalism, away from the South African media, and particularly anything that might make the black man feel unsatisfied with his lot. John Foster's government appointed a commission of inquiry into matters relating to television in 1971, and it recommended that should a television service be introduced to South Africans, effective control would be needed to favor the needs of the nation and country. That's right, South Africans didn't have mainstream TV or even television sets at home by the mid-1970s because of the government's fears of its loss of control over mines and the use of satellites to access foreign television broadcasts that hadn't been censored by the government yet. Tell you more about the SABC and censorship later though. When we eventually got television, NASPERS launched MNET as a subscription-based service to compete with the SABC in 1986. The business created to manage their decoder sales, subscriber services and account management, multi-choice, became NASPERS' main video entertainment enterprise and it launched DSTV not long after its creation. In my opinion, most South Africans understand DSTV as a monopolistic actor, charging high fees, yet stingy on variety and startlingly lacking in quality. But they tried to cover a lot of bases with aggressive marketing targeted at black southern Africans in particular and a plethora of bits and bobs. In 2017, DSTV admitted to contravening the Competition Act and price fixing but it continues to be the television service of choice for many South Africans, not least in part because of its eagerness to produce South African versions of international commercial successes like The Mars Singer, Love Island, the Real Housewives, etc. We hold firm that by creating increasingly unique and authentic local content, we will continue to resonate with our customers, MultiChoice said in its annual price increase statement. While I haven't started watching the show myself, it's reported to be the best performing drama series for the continental media giant MultiChoice, with 3.6 million views in South Africa and hitting number one on the DSTV app across Zambia, Zimbabwe, Botswana, Namibia and elsewhere. But there are whispers. And then I remembered there was another show about Shaga Zulu, about whom you can learn more in episode one of Who Messed Up South Africa, that's up on my channel right now if you don't know who I'm talking about and wondered if the SABC held a glitzy premiere party for that and the more I tried to find out more about it, the more I realized that it's a bit too optimistic for this country in the late 80s. Eventually, I came across this critical review of the series, highlighting the oppressive environment in which art was being made at the time, also prompting questions about the nature and principles of the entertainment industry, especially what we watch on TV. And that's what I want to talk to you about. Hello everyone, what is up? Welcome back to my channel where I periodically post videos about history and make some commentary for my now 645 wonderful subscribers. You guys are seriously really the best. The support and appreciation for my work goes a long way, especially when you drop a like and comment telling me what else you want to see me talk about. If you remember from my last video, I mentioned wanting to do some stuff on contemporary topics and I feel like today's video is a good balance between high teen centuries and modern mass media for me and my interminable hunger for stories about the past. If that's your kind of thing too, come read the stern condemnation of anti-black propaganda with me. Howard Rosenberg wrote Shaga Zulu, negative metaphor for South African blacks, 16 years into his television critic career. So the four opening paragraphs of the article really transfer the crux of his observations with the attendant skill that the media consuming public would do well to interrogate just how well-meaning or creative the art could be if the artist, or at least the artist's sponsor, was a known villain. Apartheid art? 
it opens, Shaga Zulu is a gory, foolish, and demeaning 10-hour miniseries. Shot in South Africa, it seems to shape history to fit a contemporary political theme. Yesteryear's supposedly bloodlusting Zulus fill nearly every frame, reinforcing a wild tribal image in contrast to civilized whites. Rosenberg is right to conjure up bewilderment for apartheid art, as he rightly classifies the series, though it sits in the historical novel genre. The production was heftily funded by the apartheid regime, who knew they couldn't lead with the involvement of Bruderbond controlled SABC if they wanted anyone to see it. So an American proprietor, investor, kind of distributor was brought on in hopes that audiences wouldn't notice the opening credits and ask, wait, isn't our government imposing sanctions on South Africa? Why is this on the box? I started looking into how it actually got made, having only a surface understanding of the situation when I wrote that last part. I was misguided about the depths of convoluted scheming that held white minority rule intact back then because I was befuddled, gobsmacked, done to be finished when I landed on a QA and a with Shaga Zulu's writer Joshua Sinclair that I highly, highly recommend you read after this. It's a long, long read, but so enlightening, so informative. Let me read you just the parts that I found the most informative and relevant for this video. Camera in the Sun spoke with Sinclair for a September 2013 interview about the making and legacy of Shaga Zulu and his take on South Africa's anti-apartheid movement. How did your interest in Shaga Zulu come about? I was studying medicine and on my way over South Africa to India, I was at Baragwanath Hospital in Soweto and it was my first impact really with Africa. I had already written two other films because I started writing films when I was 14. I didn't want to do it for a living, I wanted to be a missionary. I was sitting there in Baragwanath Hospital minding my own business and they said, would you be interested in doing Shaga Zulu? I said yes, but I didn't know anything about it. So they gave me a couple of books and I read them. For me, his story was very Shakespearean, so I became a sort of a crusader. I said, I want Shaga Zulu to be a way for South Africa to liberate itself from apartheid. It is the mythological movie of all time. Shaga made Alexander the Great look like a wuss. These guys jogged 50 miles every day without shoes on. It was just incredible. Above all, I wanted to show this is an Africa that nobody ever stopped to look at and nobody ever stopped to ever think about. It was being commissioned by South African Broadcasting. They wanted to do it for TV3. TV3 is in Zulu. Because of the cultural boycott, they didn't want to appear as the ones who were commissioning it. Harmony Gold was given Shaga as a gift. It was used to bypass the cultural boycott. The head of Harmony Gold, Frank Agrama, has recently been convicted of tax fraud for his work with Silvio Berlusconi and got three years in jail, which he won't serve. I didn't even realize this was happening until years later because I had 8% of the income and I never got that. I was just given a check once by Harmony Gold for $75,000. They made 500 million. Harmony Gold before Shaga Zulu was called Far International, Farouk Agrama International. After Shaga Zulu, they suddenly had their own building on Sunset Boulevard and downstairs was this giant cutout of Shaga. South African Broadcasting did something very strange for a production company. SABC put up the entire amount of the film, about 12 million dollars or 10 million rand. The rand was stronger than the dollar in those days. But they gave 60% of the income to Harmony Gold plus expenses. That's unheard of. All Harmony Gold had to do was sell the movie, which was pretty easy. So then there were monies being funneled into a bank in Switzerland, which I think Agrima had together with Berlusconi, who was using Agrima as a fence, and South African Broadcasting was using Agrima as a fence. So the SABC didn't appear as the producers. Harmony Gold appeared as the producers, would get the money, and through a Swiss bank, give SABC back that money. A lot of it stayed in the Swiss bank and never hit South Africa. Agrima did some sales that put Harmony Gold on the map, which is actually a gold mine in South Africa, it made him rich overnight. And in a way it helped Shaga because they sold it everywhere. I told the head of the legal department at SABC, I'm just gonna do this. You guys are nuts. This is a chance for you to show the world that you're doing something good for the black people. You're showing their heritage. In a way, it makes up for many, many of the mistakes of apartheid. Why wouldn't you want people to know you were doing it? that you're spending 10 million rand on the Zulu history. That's a great plus for you, but they didn't get it. I think that's far enough for now. (laughs) Let's talk about the South African Broadcasting Corporation. 
1923, the first wireless broadcast was made in Johannesburg, according to South African History Online, and by 1927, one hour of Afrikaans programming and a daily Afrikaans news bulletin was being aired. Prime Minister J.B.M. Herzog initiated an investigation into the media enterprise following a shortage of funding for and advancements in existing wireless programs, resulting in the establishment of the SABC with a commercial radio service known as Springbok Radio, established in 1950, initially exclusively broadcast in the Johannesburg area with English Afrikaans bulletins. Through the following decades, more radio stations and some in African languages were added, all still considered NP mouthpieces. In 1976, a television service was introduced. Kevin Harris Productions on YouTube has a school documentary on the early years of TV broadcasting in South Africa that is, again, enlightening and so informative, highly recommend you check this out too. It describes in more detail this Wikipedia entry saying, at one point, most of the management of the SABC were members of the Bruderbond. I must confess that as a person who was not over-enthusiastic about the introduction of television, I'm pleasantly surprised with what I've seen so far. As its advantages, it also brings with it certain responsibilities. I made a short documentary called Jew Yoda Shuif Yuit. A day or two later, one of the other producers came to me and he stopped me in the passage and he said to me, uh, Danny, da wat vraag vraag oor jou Afrikanerskap. Nou, ons wil net seker maak dat jy in die Afrikaner in die oom dink. This followed on to what Dr. Jan Skitter said to us during our television course. A black man will never appear on my television. The Afrikaans department is what the SABC was all about. We are determined in this country to uphold those high standards of Christian civilization. May I give you a very great man, Dr. P.J. Mayer, the chairman of the SABC. The SABC. English and Afrikaans programming was mainly news, talk shows and actuality, dramas and popular plays. There were also BBC radio shows, kids and music programming. They never came to us and said, we're in the Nationalist Party government mouthpiece, therefore you can do this and you can't do that. This is the line that you don't cross. They came to us and, and, and uh, you know, they would say, no, 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 um, you, know, you, can, you can tackle any subject you like as long as you present both sides of the story. Uh, that was the chink. What you'd end up with is a program that was a total whitewash of the issue that you set out to make. And the worst thing is when you start doing it yourself so that the censor won't uh, do it for you. Once you're in that kind of Pavlovian mice uh, situation, they have achieved, achieved their objective, I think. In 1996, the ANC government reduced the amount of airtime dedicated to Afrikaans language broadcasts, reorganizing TV 1, 2 and 3 to be more representative of the country's population, apparently alienating white Afrikaners. The new organization's leadership, however, felt it necessary to retain some of the officials, technicians and staff from the apartheid period, noting the value of their years and years of experience. Good evening. The United States says it considers the African National Congress to be an African nationalist organization which is seeking to replace the present government of South Africa through violence. Any momentous event or any movement was always shown to be simply some or other sort of inchoate violent happening. Four community leaders who died last month in mysterious circumstances. Violent, voiceless, leaderless, with no point of view other than the destruction of white civilization as we know it. Remember sanctions. Now surely the state broadcaster will have to take sides with the government of the day in a situation such as this. As journalists of the state broadcaster in those days, we did not have a problem with that. It was either black, it was either white. Not in the sense of color, but it was either left or right or whatever you want to call it. But one must see this in perspective of the wider picture. So, to a certain degree, that's what bothered Rosenberg. If the juxtaposition of wild Africans with civilized whites isn't the intent of Shaga Zulu, he continues, then it's certainly the predominant message. In general, I tend to agree with the skeptical tone and interrogative style of his criticism, all the more to drive the point that several people agreed to work with proponents and benefactors of apartheid, despite the aforementioned boycotts, sanctions, and human rights abuses. This is still more black history through white eyes, with Shaga's life being described mostly in flashbacks by an Irish doctor who's part of a shipwreck delegation of whites sent to deter Shaga from exterminating settlers.
To me, this sounds like he's describing appropriation of black stories to turn white industry profits and a patronization of Africans somewhat, which is why it's annoying that Rosenberg glosses over the story of Henry Gele, who was cast to play Shaga, when he should have actually put this at the heart of his disapproval as well. It's difficult to find an assessment of this man, any comment or acknowledgement of his existence and career that isn't lauding him as great and charismatic. He's scarcely mentioned and Shaga's remembered in tandem. Playwright Kolani Majozi said Kale's untimely death in 2007 was a blow since they just finished shooting a film, Baye de Shaga, to be shown the next year. We had a long plan to go further with the production. As you know, when people saw Henry Kale, they used to associate him with the Shaga Zulu film. His death has dashed all our hopes of doing our production the way we have planned it. Kale was reported to be restrained and isolated in his hospital ward because he was prone to violent lashing out to those around him in the two weeks before his passing. While he lived, he was sought out and celebrated for his portrayals of savagery, brutality and, well, blackness as understood through the white gaze. The trope of the mysterious savage or darkest Africa really is a favored framing for stories covering colonialism. In the mythos of the origin of the Africana, the continent is imbued with mystical powers that attract men of ambition to its shores. Africa is often used as a lost world, whose barely charted depths are thick with lost kingdoms, mysterious and dangerous, but populated with outcroppings and ties to the modern world. In his interview, Sinclair explains at length the rationale involved in his casting of Tele for the television series adapted from his book. He says he understood that director William Faure, or For, Faure, I don't know, was an Afrikaner, but not if that meant he wanted the show to be South African propaganda or if he was above those politics. He only knows that it was wise for the director to sit on both sides of the issue of violence in South Africa during the 1980s because as somebody who lived there, he'd either know the safest course of action with regard to government surveillance of media or he'd just have a more nuanced understanding of the political situation. I don't know, it's not clear. He sets Will Four up as an Atticus Finch type, a hero with a lot to lose, eager to tell the pseudo-mythological story of the capture of Africa, the fall of a great king king, I think, and for himself, he chooses the bold, outspoken outsider seen by locals as an idiot because he joins the resistance and gets arrested, signs away $20 million by formally condemning the apartheid regime. Amidst all the executive clamoring, the SABC picking up that this could be propaganda, others insisting that Shaga be played by an American, the writer and director settled on their lead casting, the result of Sinclair's own mythologizing of Shaga's story. It's a cluster of trying to be the savior of black South Africans, soothing the temperaments of practicing imperialists, appeasing Mangosutu Butelezi, and making up his Shaga, the most powerful man in Africa. Kale ndo sinombe tukumbuza Komo gaisengu, waisengu ilele, waisengu imili ya kathela Kungesi, tesi ngatalua nyoni, kungesa lela masagabula Mkokele, wakokele sizo kilazwe, nitubandela Vika kakeza, ngubuye nitile mfule, ngubete mbukeza ngubisi Makayo, makayo nga ngulwande Kele Henry Kele was born in 1949, Kwamashu, and was raised by his grandmother until he had to leave school to find a way to help support the family financially. He was successful in sports, playing for Aces United, Golden Arrows, and the Jurity Football Club. In the 1960s, soccer fans gave him the nickname Black Cat being dark-skinned and agile. It's always been common for dark-skinned members of the black community to be given nicknames that acknowledge their pigmentation like black cat, munchus, or even mock them like search and black beauty. The victims of these microaggressions hardly ever object or protest, but personally, it's been horrid to witness how mirthfully, casually, and religiously dark-skinned black people are marginalized and othered. Dr. Nathaniel Granger writes that microaggression was coined by Chester M. Pierce in 1970 as subtle, stunning, often automatic, and non-verbal exchanges that are put-downs, explaining that they form part of the marginalization of certain groups, the imposition of artificial realities, the ultimate form of oppression. Perhaps the most damaging form of patronization is that of excessive praise to select members of marginalized groups. 
This undermines the group from which the recipient of the praise is from, but also alienates the representative by singling them out. This consequently leads to shame, embarrassment, and more often than not, disconnectedness from one's group, which perpetuates the familiar emotion of feeling invisible within and without one's group. Dr. Nathaniel Granger writes, In 1978, Taylor retired from professional soccer and was approached, presumably by Sinclair, though Bill Forres reported to have spotted him in the 1981 stage production first. It's funny how Sinclair insists that Forres contributed minimally to the writing and casting, like he was this maverick with a nose for Hollywood gold, when Taylor's retelling of his landing the job sounds... It was difficult for them to get someone who would look like Shaka. I didn't know that I looked like, like, like Shaka. There's only one guy who can do it, and that is Henry. Black Cat, that's my nickname in soccer. But I wasn't interested. This Henry, don't let us down. You are the only one that can portray the part of Shaka. They need the physique, voice, height, you name it. So I started on stage as Shaka, not knowing that later on I was going to be the big Shaka on the screen. Taylor played the brooding, mysterious savage exclusively following the success of the series, typecast into oblivion by Sinclair, who was extremely chuffed with this result. And he became Shaga. You take an Arapaho, you take a Sioux, and you become that because it's part of your heritage. And you don't have to act for that. This is ready-made method acting. When I did Shaga 2, they kept pushing in America for an American to do it. And I said, no, it's gotta be Henry. Henry is Shaga, and he remained Shaga, but nobody would cast him in anything else. In South Africa, it became impossible for him to be anything but Shaga. It took somebody like Michael Douglas to see him as something different for the ghost in the darkness, but nobody else really saw him as anything different. So what Henry did was go on his own junket, took his Shaga Zulu outfit, and went to places where they paid him to appear. And he did this for most of his life, until I called him back for Shaga 2. Next time you jump to say something about the great Henry Taylor, ask yourself how he might have really felt being a marionette for Sinclair to control in his imaginings. The rest of the review, without the analysis of the title character's casting, is more on the many observations about the use of scenes with blood, gore, violence, and the impact of all those on black characters for largely white audiences. As for me, my thoughts are this. We know that the SABC and South African broadcast media were built and developed with an express view to censoring images of blackness and the real black experience. We understand that these institutions started introducing black faces and voices into their ranks to amplify the echo of the boot of nationalism. What do we really think about how black stories were represented on SABC television, the many sitcoms, soapies and variety shows featuring black performers? In a future video, I'll talk about the earliest appearances of the black South African experience on TV, but I'm curious to know the opinion of my fellow South African viewers on the way townships, the insides of four or two or one room houses and life inside those homes is shown on TV programs like Generations, Skim Sam, Please leave a comment if you feel so inclined. I'm just trying to see something. As for the shows Shaga Zulu 1986 and Shaggy Lambe, well, like I said about the latter, I haven't seen it, but I do intend to, and I hope it isn't anywhere near Sinclair's realm of historical fiction. The former, these white characters get a lot of screen time to either tell you whole parts of the story that we should be seeing black characters do on screen. None of these chaps question whether or not they should morally invade the Zulu and their lands. This crime and others are written into the script as part of the crew's adventures. Much of the time, Shaga Zulu is merely confusing or bad and or hokey. The swelling chorale is straight out of a biblical epic. The script is awful at worst and comical at best. The music selections or the score or you, just the music in general for this it's very clearly not african music sometimes literally describing a scene as it happens on screen when zulu people sing or make a glorious noise it is epic it is soulful and it is large not i believe i am quite finished on this 
even if I did leave you hanging on for the rest of the review. It's engaging, clearly, so go and read it. I've been so anxious to release this because uh, the last one was back in January and I just needed to know I'm still capable of doing this because I love it. And that was in the first quarter of the year. We're now in the third. Please subscribe.